Hello, I'm Rachel, and welcome to my book club stream <laughs> thing. <laughs> wow, I go, I go, and I don't update for like one week, and I forget what I usually say. Incredible. Um, hi, <laughs> this is my book club. Welcome to the book club. Um, what's it called? Um, Vampires are my special interest book club enjoy settle down settle in we read ch vampire short stories here once a week unless it's a holiday and then it depends on if i feel like it and i didn't feel like it last week so here we are now <laughs> um but we are reading sisters of the night this one it's from 95 94 95 um edited by barbara hambly barbara hambly and martin h greenberg Woo. We are about halfway, and um, I have a bookmark this time. <laughs> Let's see, what are we starting with? Sometimes Salvation by Pat Cadigan. Mm, is everything the way I want it to be? Just making sure. I believe so. No, you can't see my little candle. Ow, ow, done, ow. It's important that you can see the candle. <laughs> Ow. No, wait. Ah, you can see it here. Move the mic. <laughs> if you're still here with me, um, <laughs> I'm gonna read the story now. <laughs> Get closer to me. <laughs> wait. <laughs> Look at its spin. Isn't it soothing? <laughs> Don't you want to listen to me? <laughs> Guinea, Ginny, Ginny, Guinea, Ginny, Ginny, it's probably Ginny. I had this problem with Harry Potter too. Ginny's dad turned her out. Yeah, that's right. It ain't an unusual story. Wish I had a dime for every little snipe turned out by dear old dad or that equivalent. Spend a couple days down here and you'll get the idea that's all anyone's dad does is turn them out. And I don't know which ones make me feel sicker, the girls or the boys. Maybe what makes me sickest of all is that they're all down here with me. Time was when you never saw a kid living rough, and now you can't go ten feet without stepping on one. What is this crap, you may wonder? Crap? Yeah, that's right. You think about what'll make a kid rather sleep rough than stay around home. Home, make that. Quote, unquote. Home, make that. And you'll think crap isn't a strong enough word for it. Do not, please, get me wrong. I am not St. Francis of Assisi, of the street children. My heart is not gold, and I do not want to do anything to improve society or the world. What I am and what I want to do are all very simple. I am a drunk, and I want to be drunk as much as possible, as long as possible. Very dull compared to what some other people want, or so I hear, mainly from the kids. Some of the kids think what I want is too easy or not interesting enough. I say to them, yeah, that's right. Going off with the John is a lot more interesting. A lot of extra challenges in there. Will I live through this? Is this the one who's going to give me AIDS? So I guess I can do without interesting. With all the kids coming and going all the time, I don't always notice them right away, and some ain't round long enough for me to notice them. But Jenny, I noticed first thing. She was trying to look like any other chronic, troublemaking, and repeat-offending, dead-end type of kid, and she was good enough that any stupid-ass citizen zombie would have been fooled but i know the difference between a kid that got thrown away early and been processed by the sewage treatment plant they call the juvenile justice system and a kid who spent most of her life eating regular and doing homework plus she slipped up when dropkick brought her around to meet me not that i was looking so all fired up to par that day it was just that her old civilized reflexes kicked in when the dropper said this is may she's been here the longest she actually put out her hand and said, how do you do? Even the dropper stared at her, and the dropper learned enough manners to pass in polite society himself. Well, never let it be said that I ain't house trained when I want to be. I invited them both for a drink. Yeah, that's right, I did. And what I gave them is pretty benign crap compared to what everyone else in the world is giving them. Besides which, alcohol is a disinfectant, so it probably killed a bunch of germs and viruses in their systems. She was just a capful. Uh, she had just a cap full, sipped a little, and made a little face. 
As I recall, I was on the last half of that bottle, so I was stretching it some, and it didn't have a whole lot of kick to it. I've mellowed out a lot since the old days when I used to do that trick with a can of sterno and a loaf of bread. So I watched her, sitting there under my bridge with me, an old dropkick, and I saw how she was. She was real tall for 13, taller than dropkick, which was actually, which actually wasn't too hard, and I could tell that she didn't like being so dirty. She kept combing her fingers through her hair and wiping her hands on her jeans, which were pretty loose on her. The, this girl was, like, skeletal. I realized after a bit, and I got kind of annoyed. I heard all about anorexics like anybody else, and I hate them. Because while I'm not St. Francis of the street kids or anything, I ain't completely heartless either. And thinking about how the kids I know don't eat regular, I got no pity in me for someone who's starving on purpose and throwing food away. Or worse, throwing it up. I mean, I am not one to talk, but I think that must be one of the few things in the world I'd name a sin if someone asked me. But nobody did ask me, did they? didn't occur to me that there would be uh eating disorder trigger warnings in this story hopefully i don't think it's brought up again but jesus christ there is no need to just kick out at people with eating disorders in the middle of your story no it's fine it's fine i'm i'm gonna i'm continuing <laughs> fuck uh, so I looked at her pretty closely then and without too much kindness and then I thought that if she really was one of those she probably wouldn't be sitting here sipping old overbolt even watered down old overbolt because we all know how fattening booze is right I'm laughing my head off at that one finally I say to her you hungry just to see what she'll say and she looks at me with those big brown eyes and nods just ever so slightly and I look over at dropkick and say what kind of host are you go get some food dropkick says this isn't my place. And I say, you know what I mean. You brought her here. I supplied the beverage. So go get us all some eau de vores. <laughs> they got a giggle out of her and the dropper immediately, obediently got up and went off to see what he could scrounge and left the two of us eyeing each other. After a long moment of silence, she says, so how long have you lived under the bridge here in the park? And I laugh and say, you're not from around here, are you, girl? And then she looks ashamed of all things. So I say, yeah, that's right, you're not. But that ain't no big deal. Nobody around here is from around here. You don't think anyone to live like this in their own hometown, do you? She giggled again and covered her mouth quick, like she'd done something wrong. Chill, I say. It wasn't that funny. The brown eyes get that trapped animal look. Never mind, hun. I already got it figured. Only thing I can't figure is why an honor student like you didn't have nowhere else to go. Nobody would believe me, she said, in that dead voice they all get when they're on about it. You know that for a fact, I asked her. Pretty much. I've got three sisters. Two of them don't believe me. The third one knows for sure I'm telling the truth, but she also tends to laugh a lot at nothing and she hears voices. She's older than me, and Dad used to like her best. She stared at me, daring me something, maybe not to believe her, or to, not be, uh, or to be not squeamish enough to hear her out. Or maybe even both. Your mother know? My mother helped. I nodded at her. Old story around these parts. Plenty others can tell it in several variations, some of them even nastier than yours. She looked a question at me, and I shook my head. Nah, my story's pretty simple. I like my booze, and I don't want to be bothered. I don't want men, and I don't want women, and I sure don't want any kids. She got this defensive look at that, at that one. Come on, honey. None of you are kids anymore, and you should also try not to take the world so personally anyway. I just like my booze, and it likes me. It's always there. It's always good. It don't criticize, and it don't make demands. It just does what it says it's going to do, and I say, when you got something like that in your life, you're coming out ahead. Think about it. Kind of funny that it was really focused on the eating disorder trigger warning, completely forgetting that we're in the story of an alcoholic. <laughs> trigger warnings aren't around if you're coming into a vampire short story read along you're gonna like you're gonna be triggered by something <laughs> so then she looks down at the capful in her hands and up at me with this dizzy kind of expression are you telling me i ought to become an alcoholic <laughs> crap no honey i'm just telling you why i am you'll go be whatever your heart tells you while you still have a heart and that gave her a turn so that she went even paler than she already was yeah that's right I told you I'm not St. Francis or anything like that, and I have seen them come and go over and over, and I know what happens to them. The job that their parents start on them, the streets will finish up, and if the streets don't do it, juvenile justice surely will. Assuming none of these, assuming none of them gets saved, quote, that is, yeah, that's right, saved. 
And they come in vans with sodas and coffee and bags full of burgers, blankets during the cold weather. They're all from God, usually, though they don't make the old mistake of trying to get the kids to pray and crap. Even the Salvation Army seems to have wised up to the old casting bread upon the waters gag. What it really is, you throw a bunch of your crap overboard and it sinks and you never see it again. You're going to help somebody, that's what happens, and you don't get your blanket back, okay? But hell, that's the nature of a gift, isn't it? And nobody asks them to come around with their stuff anyway. But always, some budget somewhere gets cut, and the first thing that goes is the so-called street ministry. This is what they usually call it. Because they can't think of selling their freaking mahogany desks or their furniture or crap like that, they keep their things and let the kids go wanting, which is the way it's always been anyway. So it's not like the kids really hurt over it or anything. But they really uh, pee me off when they do that, and it just makes me sure that I like booze better than anything or anyone. Like I said, it always does what it says it's gonna do, and it don't make any stupid promises it can't keep. One day I woke up, and Ronald Reagan was president. I thought for sure it was the DTs, and maybe it was, because the next time I looked, it was some other guy, but things weren't any better. I think they'd gotten a lot worse, as a matter of fact, because there were practically no rescue squads coming around. I'd never thought I'd actually miss Jesus people in a van with coffee and burgers, and I didn't. It was the kids that needed that stuff, and there was nobody coming around with it. Just before Jenny showed up, though, times changed again, and the vans came back with new faces with the same old things going on. Food, and promises of more food, and some help if the kids would come to the shelters. I don't tell nobody to go, and I don't tell nobody not to go, even if the kids ask me. I just tell them what I told Jenny. You do what your heart tells you to do while you still have one. This is, I think, the only thing you should tell anybody when they ask you what they should do. Because really, all they're asking for is permission to do that. And if they feel like they gotta get somebody's permission, why the heck not give it to them? Yeah, that's right. I had it all figured out, didn't I? Me and the booze, we had it all mapped out. And then something happened that made it all different. Then she came along. Now when I think about it, I'm surprised someone like her didn't show up sooner. The pickings, here's, uh, the pickings here are pretty good for that kind. Plenty other kinds came round, besides the Jesus people, of course. We had all manner of pimps. No, excuse me, there's really only one kind of pimp. And they only got one thing they sell. And some might think it's all kinds of this and all kinds of that. But then there's some so stupid they think 15-year-old boys blow strange, ugly men because they like sex too. When she showed, I thought at first she was another Jesus person. I was on my way home from a dumpster run with not too bad pickings. I skipped over a period there. (laughs) When she showed, I thought at first she was another Jesus person. I was on my way home from a dumpster run with not too bad pickings. Expiration dates and crap like that mean that some of us on tighter budgets eat as well as anybody. So I was passing the old truck dock on my way down the hill to my end of the park, and there she was handing out doggy bags and cans of soda. Now, I was impressed with the canned sodas, though someone was probably going to bleed over them. Recycle money can mean one less blowjob, which is pretty serious stuff. So all the kids were there. It looked nice, and her being a new face, I stopped to check. Handing out like Jesus, smiling like a pimp. Yeah, that's right, I thought. What we needed around these parts was a pimp pretending to be Jesus. That would make everything perfect. Since Mutha... Since most of the kids never got a smile that didn't come from a pimp anyway, she must have looked like just some nice lady with plenty of food to give away. I had a couple swallows in me. Don't leave home without it, especially when you don't actually have a home. See, the way it is, I got to drink as much as would get a regular person hammered just to get sober so I can go on from there and get drunk. So sometimes I have to dose up on the fly to keep straight. I know when I need some because I get a little taste of the DTs when it's been too long. That's what I figured I was getting standing there watching her with the kids because there she was with her pimp smile and her pretty face and her shiny hair and suddenly I saw an animal. Uh, Let me get a drink. Big eyes with slitted pupils, nasty teeth, hungry, sniffling them kids, tasting the air around them to get their flavors. If you saw that, you'd reach for a fucking drink too. (laughs) A couple swallows was all it took to make stuff look normal again. Mostly normal. Still had the pimp's smile, which made me think of the nasty teeth, but I didn't see any. 
Then Dropkick pushes Jenny over to this woman, and Jenny is trying not to go. The woman is holding a bag in one hand and a can in the other, and her pimp smile goes from sort of curious to outright crap. How to describe this? You'd see that look on someone's face when they fall in love at first sight, I think. Or if they find a wallet in the gutter with a thousand dollars in it. That kind of look. Lust and greed and pure delight. Candy, little girl? Or a burger? I went as far as to take a step toward them. Yeah, that's right. I wasn't thinking. Mainly, I think I wanted to get a better look at her, see if there was any look of the beast left in her now that I'd had my swallows. And then her and Jenny both turned to me, and I think, crap, the DTs are bad this time. They look wrong, like a matched set, but wrong. That's all I know. Better hurry home and get outside of a bottle, which it so happens I have, some not-so-bad stuff that I was intending to stretch. But my rule is, first prevent delirium, tremens, and worry later. Quite a bender. I disappeared down a black hole for a while, weird visions and crazy dreams. I ain't too wild about that part of it. Everybody I ever met in my life came to visit me under the bridge in the park, and I think some of them might actually have been there. Dropkick, for example, and Jenny. And some little kid I couldn't remember the name of. Hadn't seen her for a long time. Little 11-year-old throwaway. She'd been living rough for a while by the time she found her way to the old truck docks where most of the kids stayed. I was drinking hard a lot of the time she was around. The most I remembered about her was she was letting her hair go dread, like a Rastafarian, which doesn't look as weird as you might think on a pubescent white girl, at least not if you've seen half the crap I've seen anyway. But yeah, that's right, she came to see me in my bender visions. She was a little bit older, just the way she would have been in real life, but she was also dressed better, dressed up and no crap uh, no cheap crap out of some thrift shop. Overpriced denims from some store with an overcute name and a trend color t-shirt with a little breast pocket barely big enough for an M&M and still the dreads in her hair. Miss Pimp came with her. The way they were both staring, I knew the little one had told Miss Pimp about me and I tried to remember what she would have known. Maybe just that I was down here under the bridge, nobody's queen bee and nobody's mother and nothing like St. Francis. She gave her pants a little tug to save the knees, just like a citizen, and squatted down to look at me closer. You listened, she said. Maybe you don't remember now, but I knew you were listening then when I told you. I told you everything, and you heard me, and you didn't tell me I was bad, and you didn't try to tell me what I should do. All I wanted was to tell someone, just get it out. I tried to focus on her, but somehow my vision went right past and fixed on Miss Pimp behind her. The way I was, and the position and all, she looked twenty feet tall, and she didn't squat down. That head tilts to one side, the kid says, help her. She says, I haven't been invited. So then the little one says, well, I was once. Like that, I understand, and I pass out. I woke up right after someone took the gym socks out of my mouth. It felt like, anyway. What sky I could see from where I was lying looked gray and blah. I didn't feel much like moving, so for a long time, I didn't. Eventually, I got a sense for how I was lying there on the ground, almost spread eagle, with my neck bent over to my right. I think I must have looked kind of dreamy, actually. Or I, I would have, except nobody coming off a bender looks that good. Nobody makes you do anything after a bender when you don't matter. So since there was nobody to make me move, I just laid there until I felt like something else until I felt like doing something else. And then it hurt. The top of my head caved in and went crashing through six floors of a brain, a couple levels of throat bile, and made a direct hit on my stomach so that the dry heaves bent me in half, and I sat up without meaning to. There she was, slumped against the wall, deep asleep like she didn't have a care in the world, except, of course, she did. Lots of them, but I couldn't figure why she'd brought them to me. I picked up a little pebble and tossed it at her. She just twitched, took two more direct hits, one on the shoulder and the other on her forehead before she woke for me. That last one must have stung like a hornet. What are you doing here? I say to her. Ginny yawns, covering her mouth politely, pushes her dark hair back. She's got wavy, curly hair that could go dread pretty easy. Watching over you? I don't need nobody to watch over me, I tell her. And if you think I want to work out a deal where we take care of each other, you're dumber than I look. Because I thought it was pretty clear I ain't down here to be no mother. Jenny gets that smile like certain drug counselors I have known. Very patronizing smile, even if none of them mean it that way or think they do. 
Don't you ever worry about what could happen to you while you're passed out? No, I say. Why should I? I'm passed out. I won't feel it. Now she gives a that's not funny laugh and rolls her eyes. Suppose it's a rapist with AIDS. I guess you got a point, I say after a moment, but I don't understand why you want to make it. I got her confused now. I mean, I told you what I wanted out of life. Why are you trying to worry me about rapists with AIDS when you know I don't give a good god darn about most anything and I'd appreciate the world returning the favor? She pressed her knuckles together. I think it's because when I first looked at you, I knew I could have been looking at my own future. And now that I have a chance to prevent that future, I want to go all the way and save you too. Save me? Did this little piece of chicken just say she wanted to save me? All I can do is stare at her. I guess it's because I feel like I've erased every chance of this happening to me if I can help you, she goes on, the way she wants to help me. Yeah, that's right. She, tiny little push on that word, word as it comes out of her mouth, lets me know she's talking about who I think she's talking about. What's that pimp got in mind for you, I asked her. She gives another little laugh. She's not a pimp. She's something entirely different, something new. New? I doubt that. Ain't nothing new that comes around here. Well, yeah, okay, she's actually very old. Very old. But what she's doing, she's doing in a new way, a way that's never been done for us before. Us. I feel like a stupid echo. Maybe that's what I've come down to under this bridge. Just a stupid echo. That's okay, as long as I can still drink when I'm not doing my echo thing. Us women. Us females. She pushed herself up on her knees and learned le and leaned towards me, uh, looking hard into my face. Considering the way I know I smelled, that was no cheap trick. Don't you ever think about that? How we always have to work our way out of being some man's adjunct? That we all end up belonging to some man and have to break free of him? You see any men around me here, I said. The only men I ever been in thrall to are Jack Daniels and Jim Beam, and they ain't the jealous type. It's why you drink, she insisted. All we ever seem to do is fight to keep from being used one way or another. Or we try to dull the pain of having been used up and thrown away by using booze, drugs, things like that. Now I'm getting it. This is not coming out of her own mouth. This is all that crap the pimp put in her head. Sounds real good. Sounds like what you'd think you'd want to hear. But it's also got this canned sound. Like this little Jenny, in spite of everything, she still isn't sold. She can't quite believe no matter how much she wants to. And she's maybe even still a little scared of what the fine print on this deal is going to say when she finally reads it. What do you want? I say to her finally. What do you want to do? What do you want me to do? I'll bring her to you. Tonight. You'll be here, won't you? Not a question. Off she goes, leaving me there to wonder if my brain really could be swelling up inside my skull the way it feels. My hands are shaking, too. I really do not fucking want to see this pimp. This wasn't another idea Jenny got put in her head for her and didn't think up by herself, and doesn't even know it. So what this pimp has in mind for me, I'm right to be scared about. Son of a bitch, you know, this is why I took up drinking, so I didn't have to do crap I was afraid of. So all I had to do was take off, right? Yeah, that's right. Obviously, you've never been on a bender if you don't know how sick you get after. I was maybe about able to crawl out from under the bridge and then collapse. I should probably have been in a hospital or a drying out place with a hangover like this. I've shaken it out in some of those places on the morning after, and what I can tell you is you'll wish you were dead no matter where you are. But at least when you wake up under a bridge, there aren't any gosh darn moralizing medical types brutalizing you and calling it treatment, and then claiming you're just so screwed up that you can't stand them knocking you around. But it's also generally a lot cleaner and better smelling than under a bridge, so there's that too. It's all got its price, whatever you do. I had a lot of time to think about that, lying there, staring at the underside of the bridge, and listening to people's footsteps while they walked over. With any luck, this wouldn't be the day some cop got ambitious and decided to clean up the park by starting with me. Mostly that happened only in election years, but not being the most conscientious voter, I couldn't remember if this was one or not. I, wow, I stumbled over that sentence. Conscientious. I swear I can say it. <clears throat> I couldn't remember if this was one or not. <clears throat> Sometime in the afternoon, when the sun had moved from one side of the bridge to the other, it comes to me that I'm a lot sicker than usual this time, sick and weak. 
but with the sound of people walking over the bridge and the distant traffic and sirens and junk noise a city full of human beings tend to make dead of night visitations don't look like anything more than the old than the same old booze phantoms wearing new masks then you wonder for a moment maybe what booze phantoms really are but you don't really know anything for sure except i decided i did know and i didn't like it but there wasn't much i could do the little one what was her name had i ever known it while i apparently sat and listened to her spilling her guts drinking real hard those times sometimes the only way you can stand to hear any of it is while you're shit-faced well i was once she was what invited now i remember invited to what though a bottle party under a bridge what did that entitle her to a drink i offered her a drink i offered all of them drinks and they never turned them down maybe i thought to myself i should have been more specific about what they were drinking i just lay there all day mostly because the hideous pain in my head wouldn't let me move any more than a blank and tried to feel the spot where she must have leached on me Past the pain in my head, though, I just plain hurt all over. Even feeling all weak and faded wasn't so unusual. And maybe I should have known something by that. All my little friends that came and went, and some of them even stopping to say goodbye to that crazy old lush May. Did they ever take a goodbye sip I maybe didn't know about? And while we're at it, what kind of blood cocktail did I make? I felt her coming. It must have been that uh, it must have been like a Friday or Saturday night because the park was still real busy and sometimes when the wind was right, voices carried from way up the hill where the docks were. The kids having some kind of party, it sounded like. Maybe some new ones had come in. Weekends you can see new faces, especially when the weather's good and nobody minds sleeping outside. Although the docks are such good shelter that they're almost not outside. No trucks unload there anymore, and I couldn't tell you what was in the building. Stolen crap, maybe, or drugs, or illegal guns, or maybe just a lot of dust and an owner who didn't care except for the tax write-off. Nobody connected with the building ever bothered the kids anyway, which was why they all stayed around there, and then at night, the chicken hawks would come around. They weren't much for noise. And then it was like my mind flew out like a bird, out from under the bridge and up the hill to the, to the docks jumble of images kids faces other faces in and out of the shadows and then turning away to the street light streaks from the street lamps from cars passing with the brights on to looking up at her and her smiling down at what i now know must what i know now must be my little friend who came to see me in my bender coming back some kind of goon squad except they're supposed to be on my side the little one stops feeling me like i feel her she's under the white light of a street lamp and it's swinging overhead like a yo-yo doing the around the world trick. She stops looking around and I get this gotta do it sensation inside. The old need for a drink, now. Except it's not from me, but from inside her. And so here they come to have a drink from what's stashed under the bridge. It makes my head hurt worse, but I shove away all those pictures that don't belong in my brain. I shove them down in a way by making myself look at stuff, really look, and name what I see what i see graffiti up above me says eddie was here and somebody else put and sucked my <clears throat> cock good <laughs> and the third person had added with duck sauce which was good for a two second laugh while i tried to get up i rolled over and managed to get up on my hands and knees on the ground in front of me was the top of the hill looking down into the park just walk a little further on the bridge would come into view though you couldn't see what was under it until you got further down, especially in summer when the trees were so thick. A freaking flyer for a church pancake breakfast. All you can eat pancakes and sausage. Knights of Columbus would be doing the cooking. Yeah, that's right. Swords into plowshares, I muttered, except in urban areas where they became spatulous. Get your red hot flapjacks. Get your red hot cross buns. I could have used some of those, I thought, trying to get my feet under me so I could stand up. I crawled closer to the wall. I curved, but I thought I might be able to walk my hands up it. The image of the bridge jumps into my head and I stagger sideways, feeling my feet go like they're dancing. But somehow I stayed up, hands scraping on the dirty wall. Pain keeps me awake, new pain. I have to catch my breath, launch myself out of here. And if I can put enough distance between me and her, maybe I'll fade like a cheap AM station. But now the three of them are standing there, just out of the shelter of the bridge watching me stay up. The flashlight Jenny's carrying lights up the hole inside under here. 
I even get a look at my own startled, dirty face, wide-eyed like I was some kid making a few discoveries about life lived rough. Jenny and her give the little one in the middle a gentle push forward toward me. She looks great now, like a sleek, strong animal in her expensive denim trousers. You can't call those jeans. They've got creases, Christ's sakes, and her neat little white blouse and her tapestry vest. Fashion magazine teenager. Dread hair, yeah, but when the style changes, cut it off. It grows back, or so I hear. Or is that a myth about hair and nails growing on corpses after they're dead? She laughed at me. I don't know about that, but our hair grows just fine, even if we never grow any older. Come on, my sister. She holds out a hand to me. I look from her to Ginny. It'd make more sense if it was you six months from now, but her I don't remember at all. You remember me a little bit, the girl says, but that's okay, really. Come on, my sister. Let us help you now. She lets me see myself standing in front of her like some kind of living rack for hanging rags on. With my arms almost straight over my head, hands shifting on the rough stone while I hold myself up on the low arch of the bridge. Vertigo strikes and I almost fall forward into her. Almost. But I have been out here a long time and I have held myself up in some terrible states. Benderized, tenderized, and deep in DTs I can't describe and can't forget. So I can hold myself up under the bridge facing this for a little bit longer anyway. My head cleared, and what she'd been saying finally got through. Sister, I said. Not me. She nodded, and behind her, they nodded too. We both have a thirst, don't we? I felt her need a drink along with my own, which had been running along like an engine on low idle all day long and was now starting to rev higher. I know why you've been thirsty, what you really wanted. Now you can drink something that will really give it to you. Oh, I croaked. You bring me some vodka? Better, she says, and starts to go on. Oh, don't say that, I interrupt, feeling her words taking shape in my own throat. That's so corny, dark wine. Besides, I ain't no wino. Not unless I'm really desperate, but there was no law that I had to tell anyone that, even if they already knew it. She blinked at me. You don't understand, she says. This, too, will be your friend. It will love you, and it won't be critical, and will always do what it says it's going to. See? I remember what you told me, even if you don't remember what I told you. Come on, there is no way, this is no way for a woman to live. Your way is, I said, and laughed. I walked my hands down the wall and leaned against it with my neck bent due to the curve. My arms had been getting numb. She nods. For thousands of years, women have done what they've had to do to stay alive. Now we'll do what we want to do and flourish. We've been saved. Where does she get this stuff? And finally, I understand who's really doing the talking here. She turned you out real good. Better job than anyone else has done on you, I say, letting her see me look from her to the beast who did the deed. Probably nobody else could do anything to make you say it's right to rape somebody, but she got you. I guess blood's the thickest stuff you can get, huh? Yeah, that's right. Women don't rape each other, she said, starting to get angry at me. Rapists rape anybody they want to rape. Did you want it when she came at you with those freaking teeth and those beast eyes? I didn't understand then, she said, but I see her wavering. Yeah, that's right, I say. I guess you didn't see how it was for your own good, huh? How you was really gonna like it when you got going, and even though it hurt like a bastard at first, am I right about that? Was it painful? Even though it hurt like anything, you'd be happy afterward that you went through it. You'd want it again and again, and you'd want to do it as much as you could. What the hell? Let's turn pro, right? Isn't that right? And now I look right at Ginny, who was going to get turned out tonight along with me, and I see that for the moment. Whatever cloud came over her starting with a doggy bag of food and a canned soda, it's lifted up now, at least temporarily, and if anyone's going to do anything, it's got to be now. I throw myself down, and the little one makes a jump at me, but then I come up with the only thing I can think of to back her off, and I hope it works. For once, I was right. The Knights of Columbus Pancake Breakfast, with the line drawing of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and its happy come one, come all, break bread together sentiments driving it. That gets her. Sometimes all salvation is is somebody who cares about feeding the hungry, not feeding on them. Exact opposite of a pimp or a rapist. It sends her backing away from me, confused and scared that a dirty piece of paper I picked up off the ground has some power she can't handle and can't understand. May, Jenny says, stepping toward me, and she's looking at the other two, and then at me, and there are so many hard questions there. 
I already told you, I say, wishing it didn't hurt so much to kneel, wishing my head would just explode if that's what it was going to do. You do what your heart tells you for as long as you have a heart. How long did you want to keep it? The flashlight beam turns away from me, and the darkness feels suddenly so good and cool on my throbbing, burning head. And I must be on the verge of passing out or something, because I'm lost in the cool and soothing dark for I don't know how long before I hear Jenny say, I won't stop you if you leave now. And sometime after that, she comes and takes the paper out of my hands. I've been holding it up like St. George's shield, or maybe like I was a knight of Columbus myself. Jenny helps me sit down, and she stays by me for a while. I didn't understand why until I stopped shaking. First I knew of it. Now you want to hear the happy talk part about how I re realized the error of my ways, that there was some even bigger evils out there, and I decided to clean up, dry out, and join the holy war against them. And Jenny went with me. We found a safe place to stay, and I learned I wanted to be a mommy after all, and she learned to trust me. And pretty soon we had enough to buy a used van and a coffee urn and a bunch of old blankets. This is because you're a fool. You can't help it. In your world, the Calvary, 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 always shows up on time. Out here in the rough lane, the Calvary deserted as soon as it was out of sight of the fort and it ain't coming back. And if mommy and daddy were in the Calvary when that happened, it means they're not coming back either. So get used to it. I didn't want to think about what had happened, so I went back to drinking as soon as I could manage it. That same night, as a matter of fact, Dropkick came down to see what was going on because he'd seen the three of them trooping down this way. He owed me a favor, so I made him scrounge me a flask. It went down raw, but it went down and stayed down. I gave Ginny some, but only a little. It takes a lot for me, and I wasn't in a sharing mood especially. She didn't like it, but Dropkick took it off her hands for her. Then she just sat and watched me. Then Dropper set up the flashlight with the paper so that it was like a lamp and we were lit up for as long as the battery held out. I knew she didn't understand, but I wasn't in an explaining mood either. I was in a drinking mood. I tried to get her to leave with Dropkick, but she wouldn't go. So I knew I'd have to talk to her about it just to get her out of my hair, which, for all the neglect, wasn't going dread. Maybe dreads were a young woman's game in hell. I was practically 30. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> so she barely got the word why out of her mouth before I said, only if you never ask me again. And she nodded. And I said, really, never again, because I don't drink instead of do this crap. And that's the way I like it. Did I read that right? right? Because I drink instead of do this crap. And that's the way I like it. And she goes, but they offered. Yeah, 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 that's right, isn't it? They offered. And I guess you being a good educated girl, very smart and all, you see what they like to call parallels between their habits and mine. But I will remind you that there are some important differences. One of the big ones being that my choice of beverage doesn't have to be inside some other person before I can drink it. And the other being that I'm this way because I want to be. Yeah, that's right. I'm sure they told you that they chose their way to be too. You believe that? Maybe it's true. But now they got no choice. There's no clinic they go to to kick the habit and get straight again. There's no meetings to help you stay quit. They're, f they're freaking animals now. I saw her. She's beast. I'm a drunk and no good, but I'm still human. Sometimes that's all the salvation we get. Jenny shook her head like someone had hit her and she was dazed. Are you saying that you're going to quit this someday? Dry out or whatever? Go straight? Could I? Uh, could if I wanted to. Don't really want to. I shrugged. Listen, that creature that turns you out, that's a beast. You heart tell you to be one too? I don't see how you can be here like this and say stuff like that, she said. Me either, I said. Mostly, I don't. Mostly, I drink. And I'd appreciate being left to it. She stood up and then paused. One for the road? I held up the flask to see what was left. Okay, a little one. Make sure it's a little one or I might take a notion to suck it back out of you. She laughed a little nervously and took a very small, polite sip, not bothering to wipe the neck first. Thanks, May. I don't know what I'm going to do now. That's good, I said. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes there's salvation, too. Think about it. End of story. Pretty good. Pretty cool. I really like um, that this alcoholic mess is the main character. And I like the, the, the speech about rapists. It was a really good way to point it, uh, put it, especially for these girls who are falling for it.
Anyway, some, sometimes salvation by Pat Cadigan. Woo! The next one is going to be harder for me, because it gets it gets to be a lot of French words that I forgot to look up how to say. So <laughs> instead of saying them wrong, I, I, no, instead of looking up how to say them right, I'm choosing to say them wrong. <laughs> Get over it. I say like I'm not gonna cringe every uh, every time I get every word wrong. Okay, In the Blood by Michael Curland. I should probably take a drink so I of something not alcoholic so I can talk properly. <laughs> I really like that story, honestly. It's probably one of my favorites from the book. At least so far. <sighs> I don't remember black. I don't remember much that happened before I was 12 years old. That was, after all, a long time ago. I remember summers of piercing heat and bright skies and grapevines growing on steep hillsides. I remember ice-crushed windows in the winter and fields of mud in the spring. I remember a dark brown wool blanket that protected me from all harm when I cuddled under it and being driven to school in an open trap by Horst, our manor servant, who seemed older than time to me then, and wearing short pants even on the coldest days, when I thought my knees would freeze up and fall off if I didn't keep moving my legs. I remember Saturdays in the kitchen, helping Estman, the pastry cook, produce beautiful puff pastries for the evening's dinner and taking my reward in giant thick globs of vanilla and chocolate-flavored whipped cream. Oh my god, I want a puff pastry. Not the point. <laughs> and I remember mother, beautiful mother, in elegant ball gowns, dancing until dawn with men in bright uniforms, while I watched hiding behind a vase big enough to hold a full-grown man on the staircase landing. And I remember mother creeping into my room late at night to tuck the covers up around me and lovingly suck the blood from my neck. My name then was Almeric which is a noble name, and Mother's Rus Rosalis, which was something to do with flowers. Uh, I was a nursemaid who took, uh, why am I? I had a nursemaid who took care of me. Her name was Lisbeth, and she was a chubby, good-hearted person who taught me French and kept me out of trouble mostly. She also answered all my questions, both in French and in my native German. At some point, I realized that she made up what she didn't know, and much of what she did know wasn't so. Her world was populated with hobgoblins and ghouls and vampires, as well as with fairy princesses and handsome princes. It was particularly full of handsome princes who were riding around searching for beautiful young nursemaids to marry. One time I asked Lisbeth with the inexorable, cruel logic of the young, why would any prince want to marry you? You don't know how to be a princess. Why wouldn't he just take you back to his palace and ravish you whenever he felt like it and make you clean pots the rest of the time? <laughs> Lisbeth called me a cruel, heartless boy and reported the conversation to Mother. Mother scolded me, but I could see that she was more amused than annoyed. She wanted to know what I thought ravish meant, and I told her that it meant something like kiss, but I wasn't sure just what. It happened in all the books Lisbeth read. Thick gothic novels full of ghosts and murderers and gloomy castles and other wonderful things. I read them as soon as Lisbeth put them down. I read anything that wasn't nailed down or locked up. As a result, I had a wide knowledge of things that I didn't have the slightest understanding of. My father's name was Casimir, which was the name of kings. He was a tall, dark, silent finger. Finger. <laughs> tall, dark, silent finger. <laughs> who was notable in my life mostly for his absence. I can remember him being with us no more than three or four times in those days, and then for less than a month each time. His presence was not known in the village. I was instructed to never mention it, and he kept to his study when tradesmen or visitors called upon my mother. I knew, without being sure how I knew, that most of the young men who paid court to my mother thought she was a widow and she did not uh she did nothing to discourage this illusion illusion oh my god occasionally when i worked up my courage i asked mother about my father i don't remember at this remove what i was afraid of 
Mother didn't get angry, and she replied to my questions with full, if vague, answers. Perhaps it was the vagueness that made me apprehensive, afraid that one day she would answer me more directly, and I wouldn't like what I heard. What is father like? I asked her one day. She paused to consider her answer. He is a great and wise man, she told me, and very strong. Men who think themselves important and powerful tremble when he walks into the room. Do you tremble? I asked. She smiled and nodded. Oh yes, she said. I tremble. It was shortly after my twelfth birthday that mother suddenly announced that we were moving. She gave no reason, and it didn't occur to me that she might not, she might need one. The ways of adults are mysterious, and the ways of mother were mysterious even to other adults. The only explanation mother would give me was that in times of stress, people often take their fears out on strangers. The villagers had indeed become frightened of something over the past few months, and had taken to locking their doors at night and putting up their shutters. But when I asked the shopkeepers about it, they looked at me strangely and changed the subject. I told my mother that they couldn't consider us strangers, as we had lived there for as long as I could remember. That is so, she told me, but not for as long as they can remember. You are regarded as a stranger here for at least three generations. Mother had pulled me out of the village school several days before, saying that she was preparing me to go to boarding school. This had thoroughly alarmed me. But when we were alone, she hugged me and told me that it wasn't so, that she wasn't planning to let me out of her sight anytime soon. Always remember you are my blood, she said, and I love you. She paused to consider. I love you more than oranges. A powerful oath indeed, as mother truly loved the fleshy oranges that were shipped to us from Spain in heavy oak barrels. We spent those days preparing, and then we left in the middle of the night. A dray carrying most of our possessions had gone two days ahead of us, also leaving in the dead of the night. Mother, mother placed a large envelope on the hall table for the butler, with the letter dismissing the staff and enough money and gold coins to give each servant two months' wages in lieu of notice. We went in the carriage, surrounded by trunks and boxes. Horse drove, and I noticed that the carriage's axles and springs had been heavily greased and the horse's hooves had been muffled with rags. Our carriage lanterns were not lit, and we took the old road that ran behind the manor house and up the side of the mountain. It wasn't much of a mountain, as mountains go, but Horst still had to climb down from his seat several times and lead the horses. Twice Mother and I got out and walked to ease the burden on the horses. Near the top of the mountain, we were perhaps two leagues from the manor house. We paused to rest the horses before beginning the steep, descent into the valley below. I turned to get one last look at the house, or at the dark space in the night where I knew the house to be, but it wasn't dark. Look, mother, I said, little lights all around our house. She turned to look. Torches, she said. I hope the servants get out all right. Get out of what? I asked. M uh, the house, mother said. Just then the ground floor windows along the side facing us lit up from the inside, casting a bright glow as though a hundred candelabra had been lighted all at once. And then I could see flames coming through one window, and then another. We better go, Mother said to Horst. Yes, Baroness, Horst agreed. It is a pity. Yes, Mother agreed. Some of the paintings. But it's a pity we've seen before, eh, Carl? We got back into the carriage, and the horses started slowly down the steep path. I was silent for a long time, thinking. Mama, I asked. Why are they burning down the house? They are angry, she told me. At us? What did we do? nothing, but they do not know that. There were rumors about us, about me, and in times of trouble, rumors become facts. What sort of rumors? Mother smiled. They say I change form and go out at night, killing sheep and children. Mama, how can anyone think such things? It is happening, Mother said. Sheep are dying and small children are being taken from their bedrooms through locked and shuttered windows, also oxen and rabbits. An occasional young, foolhardy men who venture out at night to catch the marauder. Who could be doing such things? Those who don't say it's me, Mother said, say it's a wolf. But wolves don't attack people, I said, not unless they're threatened. That is so, Mother agreed, but some claim to have seen a wolf. Then, a werewolf, Mother told me, a shape changer, an ancient nemesis rapidly dying out because of their lack of judgment. But we will speak no more of this. I have noticed that changes in one's life are not gradual, but come tumbling all at once when one least expects them. One week I was a contented twelve-year-old boy going to the village school, basking in the reflected importance of my mother, 
who occupied the manor house and was thus the most important person for leagues around. And the next, we were fleeing in the night, suspected of hideous crimes, and the manor house itself was in flames. I fell asleep and had exciting and uncomfortable dreams. Sometime later, as the coach took a particularly heavy jounce, I woke up to, found myself, to find myself cradled in mother's arms. She was staring out the window at the rising moon. I looked at her slender, intelligent face, gleaming pale white in the moonlight, and marveled at my fortune at having this wonderful woman as my mother. Another question came to me. Baroness? Mother reached down and smoothed my hair. Yes, my son, she said. What sort of baroness are you? Does that mean father is a baron? And why did you call Horst Karl? This is a time of change, mother told me. We go to a new place and start a new life. And to mark that change, we will all take new names. Horst is now Karl. As of tonight, I am the Baroness Edelia von Hochbergen. You, if you approve, are Peter von Hochbergen. I mentally savored the name and decided that it had a good feel. And father, I asked, father will not be spoken of by any name, mother said. We traveled by zig and by zag with many stops to Paris. First, we stayed for two months on Corfu, an island at the mouth of the Adriatic across from the heel of the boot of Italy. We lived in a whitewashed house surrounded by fig and olive trees in sight of the sea. Mother saw many visitors who came to pay homage to the visiting baroness, and I didn't go to school. From there, we moved to Trieste, a city of narrow, twisting streets which then belonged to the Austrian Empire although almost everyone who lived there spoke Italian. We stayed in a long, narrow, three-story house in one of the windy streets with a carriage horse, uh, with a carriage house in back, and we had nine servants, the bare minimum, mother said, for civilized living. Visi <laughs> okay, <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> oh God, there's too much stuff over there. I can't put my cup down. Don't look over there. <laughs> um, visitors came to see us here too and I was int introduced to some of them most were local dignitaries greeting the newly arrived elegant young baroness but some seemed to know mother from an earlier time these were the ones I was introduced to and they treated me with great respect and said things that made me realize that my world was a far more complicated place than I had imagined a tall man dressed in black with a prominent nose, skin like white parchment, and deep set eyes like a hawk, shook my hand gravely when mother called me into the library to meet him. Count Sigismund was his name. So this is the boy, he said. Has the power begun to grow in him yet? Does he know the words? Does he know the way? Not any of it yet, mother said. There is time. Yes, the man agreed. Much time. He bent over until his nose was but inches away from my own. My hidden name is Hasha Pitletzer, he told me, and I am of the inner circle. I respect your father, and I cherish your mother, and I pledge my aid in times of trial. I hope you shall never have to call my pledge. Sigismund, mother said, that's very kind. No more than you have done for me and mine. Count Sigismund Hasha Pitletzer said, I leave now. We must not gather. I feel the need approaching, and I would as soon be in the countryside. I have to move this. It's giving me a headache. Boop, 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 <laughs> Pretty candle. Nobody else cares. <laughs> uh, whew. Uh, my mother nodded. The first rule, she said. Take care. And you. He kissed my mother on the cheek shook hands formally with me and left now i had questions indeed mother i began come upstairs mother said we went up to mother's sitting room and she settled down on the chaise lounge and took her shoes off there are some things you must know she told me and you will learn them over the next few years i stood by the window so full of suppressed excitement that i could hardly keep still years i raised my arms in supplication mama i can't wait years there are things I have wondered for as long as I can remember, and I have not asked. But now I see that they concern me, don't they, Mama? And I want to know. Mother smiled and shook her head. Some I will tell you now, she said, and some you would not understand, and you would be frightened and perhaps horrified without cause, because you did not understand. 
I could make up a fiction, but I will be honest with you and tell you nothing but truth. She held her hand out to me and I took it. I love you more than oranges, but you must let me decide what truth to tell you when. I took a deep breath and let it out at a slow, measured rate, remembering that mother had taught me thus so long ago to cool the blood she had said and allow reasons to replace emotion. What would you tell me, I asked. What questions have you? Tell me, I said. Why the villagers burned down our house. Tell me why you bite my neck. Tell me about the hidden names and the inner circle and the power and the words and how we are different from other people. I will tell you some of what you ask, she said. But remember, this knowledge is not to be shared. I know that, mother, I said, annoyed that she should tell me anything so obvious. It is not enough to know it, she told me. You must feel it with every atom that is you. It must be a part of you. When being tortured, when making love, when trying to impress some maiden into lowering her last defenses, these are things you must not even think of saying. I understand, I said more soberly. No, you don't, she told me, but you will. At the side of the chase lounge, there was an ancient Chinese rug, about six feet long by four feet wide, of an intricate pattern in which I imagined I could see dragons flying and armies attacking walled cities and other wondrous things. I sat carefully on the rug so as to disturb neither the dragons nor the armies and looked up at Mother. We, you and I, are of a race apart from mortal men, she told me. Not that we are not mortal, but for us the sands of time trickle slowly down the glass and do not rush in an ever-increasing torrent to the final grain as they do with our neighbors. For this reason, and others, men fear our sort and loathe us, and destroy without pity any of us they identify. For a time I could say nothing. The idea, the fact, of what I had just heard was repugnant to me, and I hardly dare allow mother to go on. Why should anyone feel so about me, or my beautiful mother, or my silent, intelligent, powerful father? What are we then? I asked. I felt a curious sort of fear as I waited for Mother's response, as though I knew that there were words that could hurt me just by their utterance. Mother took the shawl from around her shoulders and used it to cover her legs. We are known by many names. Lamia is a common one, as is Succuba, but the first confuses us with witches and the second with demons, neither of which are we. We call ourselves the Strix, which is Latin for a sort of owl. But the most common name that others have for us, she said, staring at me with a strange intensity, is vampire. The word hung in the air. I felt curiously lightheaded and my heart thumped inside my chest. And were I not sitting down, I would assuredly have fallen over. Vampire, I repeated. The stories I had heard of vampires from Lisbeth's thick books, from the whispered fears of the townspeople, assaulted my consciousness like physical blows. Vampires were the undead who sucked the blood out of children and their beds in locked and shuttered rooms. Vampires appeared in the guise of beautiful women to lure men to their, to lure young men to their doom, and then resumed their true shape as horrible demons and ate their victims. Vampires could change themselves into huge birds or bats and fly off in the night. When vampires roamed the dark, no man or woman was safe until they could be found in daylight and an oak stake must be driven through their hearts where they slept the sleep of the undead in their coffins. I don't want to be a vampire, I said, when again I could speak. Mother stared at me sadly, as though she had shared every image that had raced through my mind. The stories are exaggerated, she told me, distorted, as though held up to a twisted mirror. We are not that. Then why do they say what they say, I asked. Mother sat up and rubbed her left leg, massaging the muscle lying under a small scar in her calf. Hardly noticeable, it pains her when the weather changed, but she seldom spoke of it, and I did not know how she got it. The horrible thing about distorting mirrors, she said softly, is that you can still recognize yourself in them. But I don't do those things that vampires are said to do, I said, and you don't either, Mother. Do you? She smiled. Change my shape and fly off into the night. Sleep in a coffin? Go about the countryside murdering small children? No, I do not. There was a knock on the door and Anna Maria, a ruddy-faced girl of 15 who was the downstairs maid, poked her head in. The lady has a caller, she said. Count Bre Brekinski. Brekinski. Carl put him in the library. Very well, mother said, glancing over at the clock on her dresser. Thank you, Anna Maria. Come all the way into the room when you want to tell me something. Don't just poke your head through the door. Yes, my lady, Anna Maria said, bobbing her head and retreating to the other side of the door. Mother turned to me. He is a Polish nobleman, and befriending him might be useful, she said. 
Go so that I may change into something more elaborate. I stood up. I'm sorry, Mother. I didn't mean to keep you. Mother laughed. Don't be silly, my precious orange. You are more important to me than any five noblemen, or ten, or fifteen. Besides, if I don't keep him waiting, he'll think I'm not important. Go now, and we'll talk again. A month or so later, Mother took me for a ride in the trap. Just the two of us, pulled by a dependable mare named Phoebe. We traveled the post road that curved along the hills above the Adriatic until we came to a delightful place with wildflowers growing along a stream that suddenly dropped off into the ocean. There we stopped for lunch, spreading the food on a flat-topped boulder that served as an admirable sideboard. When Mother finished eating, she wiped her hands and called me from the side of the cliff where I was watching the waves below. There are some things you must know, she told me, and it is time. Most things that mark as different will come to you of themselves, as they are laws of nature. But you must also learn the law of the Strix. She sat on a camp stool, beckoned me to her, and took my hand. In case of need, in case I am not about to help you, these things must you know. Where would you be, I asked. One never knows from day to day, she said, brushing her hair away from her face. That was a dangerous side. It means keep away. What does? Mother repeated the gesture. It is a sort of secret language using the body instead of the mouth. She moved her hands in a certain way. Do what I do, and I'll tell you what she said. For the rest of the afternoon, until we left for home, I practiced moving my hands and arms thus, and twisting my head and shoulders thus, and upper body thus, each subtle move conveying a remarkable amount of information to anyone who understood the language. Thereafter, I took lessons from Mother once or twice a week, and practiced daily before a looking glass, in a short time, we were conversing secretly in public. It was a simple language, but amazingly expressive. Mother, who had a wicked wit, would comment on the appearance or speech of those around us, and would often break up laughing for no reason that anyone else would see. This taught me self-control. We arrived in Paris in May of 1816, bringing with us those of our household staff from Triste, <laughs> who were willing to move with us. A large house had been prepared for us on Rue Batelour, a short distance from the beautiful, wide Avenue de Champs-Élysées. Oh, that was terrible. Deal with it. <laughs> and staffed with enough servants to get our household going. Horst, or Carl as he was now, had gone ahead and seen to everything. Louis the Eighteenth was king of France. Napoleon had been banished to St. Helena, and the Parisians were doing their best to make it seem as though they had always wanted it that way. Mother hired a tutor to give me lessons in history and geography and to improve my French. I spoke German and Hungarian fluently, could carry on a decent conversation in Polish, and had picked up a speaking acquaintance with Italian during the six months we stayed in Tritis. I thought I spoke French already also, but it turns out I was mistaken. Lisbeth was from Alsace, not Paris, and the Parisians didn't recognize her accent as French. When I spoke the French of Lisbeth, they refused to understand me. My world differed from that of my young companions in ways they could not comprehend. I was learning slowly and seemingly by chance what it was to be that which I did not want to admit. Carl, my mother's faithful servitor, prowled the streets at night once or twice a month, and when he came home at dawn, he was sluggish and stupefied, and sometimes there was a hint of blood about his lips. Mother slept most of the day and was up most of the night. Sunlight, she said, hurt her eyes. It had always been thus, but I had never thought it worth noting until she told me of our heritage. No one among our growing circle of acquaintances in Paris thought it unusual, but the Baroness Idelia von Hochbergen would seldom make appointments during the day. In the second year of the second reign of Louis the Eighteenth, the king's subjects worked hard to not at not thinking of anything as being unusual. The emigre nobility of Europe, many of them made homeless or stateless by the predations of Bonaparte Bonaparte, that guy, had settled in Paris. They worked hard at being blithe and succeeded, for the most part, at merely being bizarre. Over the next few years, I learned many things. I perfected my French. I learned to dance and to fence and to play the violin terribly bad, tolerably bad, <laughs> tolerably badly. Good lord. Okay. <laughs> Mm. 
Mm. I learned philosophy. Philosophy. I'm I'm going to riot. I learned philosophy from Herr Doctor Professor Brugel, by which she meant all of human knowledge except dancing, fencing, and music. Herr Doctor Professor Brugel traveled Europe studying and teaching. He possessed nothing except nine crates of books, a beard which went below the middle button of his vest, and of course, all of human knowledge. When I was 15, I asked him about vampires. He leaned back in his wooden chair, folded his hands over his substantial stomach, and glared at me. So, he said, why vampires? Just a question, said, I said, something I heard. I wondered what was true. What is believed or suspected, you mean, he corrected me. For the truth, you would have to ask a vampire. This, I understand, is not a wise course. Then there are such things? Herr Doctor Professor Brugel shrugs. What is truth? There are certainly legends, ancient legends, although whether that would tend to make them more true, I cannot say. And then there are stories that are more than legend, but how much more, and what do they mean? Like most truth, they are capable of many different explanations. What legends, I asked. In Poland and Hungary, they tell of undead creatures that suck the blood from the living. Among the Greeks, they tell of Lamia, beautiful woman kin to the succuba, who lure men to their deaths. In France, they speak of a type of ghoul who murders small children and performs unspeakable acts upon their bodies. All of these are equated with the vampire. What do you think? The professor stared thoughtfully into space. In this age of enlightenment, it is difficult to believe any of it, he said. And yet... He paused for what seemed like an hour, and yet there are corpses, I have seen them, found in unlikely places, their bodies drained of blood and sometimes partly eaten away. What do you think of this, I asked. He shrugged. I think the eating was done by foxes or rats, but the blood, he sat up. Enough. What were we speaking of before this? Ah, yes, the doctrines of menschus. I never, um... Uh, I never continued that conversation with mother, although as time passed, she hid less and less from me. Those things I did not want to know, I refused to observe. As a horse wearing blinders will not be frightened by things out of its direct view, so I refused to allow myself to be aware of the meaning of peripheral events, like Carl with blood on his lips, or mother's dalliance with handsome young men who subsequently disappeared. Perhaps it wasn't blood, I told myself. But raspberry jelly, perhaps mother's young men, disappointed in love, had merely fled to North America. I began to look in myself for signs of abnormality, a desire to kill small children or suck blood, or sleep in a coffin, but none of these symptoms manifested themselves. I matured physically over the next few years until, when I was 16, I could easily have passed for 20, except that I was able to grow neither must, uh, mustache nor beard. Mathematics the handling of an epee, ballroom dancing, the arts of love, and the supercilious super super manners of a young lord. All these I mastered. Face hair only eluded me. Saying that word eludes me. Two words after my 17th birthday, mother called me into her chambers. As I entered the sitting room, the setting sun cast its rays through the window behind her, illuminating her slender body through the flimsy garment she wore. I stared at the perfection of form that was my mother and thought that she looked far too young to have me as a son. Were she not my mother, I would surely have felt carnal desire, but instead I felt a curious mixture of fear and awe. She had not aged, as far as I could tell, in my lifetime. Mother saw me looking and stepped aside out of the sun's rays and gathered her robe about her. You are approaching manhood rapidly, she said, casting herself into one of the easy chairs that quartered the fireplace. Have you given any thought to what you would like to do? I sat gingerly in the opposite chair. Yes, I said, but I have reached no conclusion. Air doctor Professor Brugel suggests that I enroll at the Sorbonne or the University at Heidelberg or... Powder. Several of my friends have joined the army, but I confess that has small appeal for me. You were not destined for regimentation, Mother said. She paused for a long time until the silence grew almost tangible between us. The time is approaching when you will feel certain urges, she said, which for other people would be unnatural. You must know that for you they are natural and right. Of what are we speaking, I asked. You will know, Mother said. It was shortly after this that I left for Powder. Padu, Padu, Padua, Padua, Padua. You know what? 
it's probably closer to it yeah <laughs> the city still had its medieval wall around it but the university was a hotbed of progressive thinking i studied art and architecture and talked to politics and was happy i fell in love her name was madeline bianchi and she was the youngest daughter of a family of acrobats her brother, Marcello, objected to our seeing each other at first, but Marcello and I arm wrestled one evening and got drunk together, and he decided I was all right. He couldn't understand how I beat him in arm wrestling since he had arms the size of young trees, and I was wiry to the point of being skinny. I was also amazed at the extent of my physical strength. I never did anything to develop it, having a strong dislike for any sort of exercise except fencing. In May of 1824, I left... I've already forgotten how to say it, that city, <laughs> to travel north with the Bianchis. I did not attempt to join their act, but I made myself useful. I had not been home for two years, so I looked forward to surprising Mother when we reached Paris. It was late at night when we arrived at a field outside Paris after almost two months on the road. While the others bedded down, I left the wagon and made my way to the Rue Bataleur. It was as well, it was well after midnight, I just... As it was well after midnight, I decided not to wake the porter and climbed the wall and entered the house through my old bedroom window. The room was as I had left it, except that everything was in its proper place, a result I had never been able to achieve. The servants were, of course, long asleep, but Mother was often awake until dawn. I left my room and went down the hall to Mother's chambers. The door to her sitting room was partly open and the light of a candle spilled into the hall. Someone groaned from within, and then again. I stood frozen at the door for some time, unable to enter or leave. My mind conjured up grotesque, horrible images of what was taking place inside that partly open door. Finally, as if drawn by some power greater than myself, I crept silently through the door. The sitting room was empty. The flickering candlelight came from the bedroom beyond. The groans, also coming from the bedroom, did not stop, but rather rose in intensity and frequency as I listened. The bedroom door stood wide open. I went to it like a thief and, concealing myself against the wall, peered cautiously through the door. In the light of a candle on the dresser, I saw a dress and an army officer's uniform and various articles of underwear strewn about the floor as though removed in haste. And then there's some, obviously, her mom's having, his mom's having sex with someone. Um, I was frozen in place, hating myself for continuing to look and yet unable to turn away. I saw my mother as she rolled over and rose to her knees. I saw her lean over the handsome young warrior and smile, fitting her body to his until she had pinned one arm and one leg. I saw her sink her teeth into the man's throat. For a minute, the man did not move, and then his eyes flew open and a look of terror crossed his face. He screamed and tried to struggle up, but mother held him down as though he were a small child, her teeth still fastened at his throat. In another minute, he stopped struggling and lay still. She stayed at his throat for another few moments, and then released him and lay at his side. She smiled contentedly, her lips painted red with the blood of her victim. I wanted to run screaming from that place, but I was unable to move. Slowly, Mother turned her head and her eyes focused on me. Perhaps it was the beating of my heart she heard. Peter, she said, I didn't know you were home. I stepped forward. Is he dead? Languidly, she reached for a robe at the foot of her bed and slipped into it. I should hope so, she said. A dull, stupid, arrogant man, fit only for one thing and not very good at that. He kept telling me how lucky I was that he had deigned to bed me. He was right, but not in the way he thought. <laughs> Mother pushed at the body and it rolled to the floor. I'll have Carl dispose of it, she said. Many emotions beat at my mind, but I walled them off, not daring to allow them in. I do not know what I would have done or tried to do if I had heeded my emotion. Instead, shaking with chills as though I were in the grip of some fatal illness from the effort of not feeling, I turned and left the room. I walked along the hallway and down the stairs and out the front door. I walked across Paris and out into the countryside. For the better part of two weeks, I walked, falling down by the side of the road in a stupor when I was too tired to go on, and then rising the next day and continuing on. In what direction I walked, I do not remember. Once three men with cudgels set upon me to rob me, it was better they had stayed at home. I fell on them with a savagery I did not know I possessed, and I believe I killed two of them and left the third senseless in a ditch. When I came to myself, I was in the little town of 
<laughs> Ignore, just shut. It's a little town. Some distance to the west of Paris. I worked. I worked as a day laborer, renting myself out to various farmers as they needed me. I stayed in the home of a local widow who cooked my meals for a modest fee. As I was so obviously not a peasant, the consensus was that I must be on the run from the gendarmes, which gave me an undue popularity among the locals. It was here that my heritage caught up with me. Slowly over the next year, the feeling emerged, the morbid need for blood. I had not returned to my beloved Madeline for fear that this would happen, and now, horribly, my fear was justified. The unusual craving slowly grew in me until I could think of nothing else. I took to prowling the town at night, hoping to waylay some secret lover making his way home before the dawn. But when I found a victim, I could not strike. These people had done me no harm. I could not simply kill one of them to satisfy my unnatural lust. But then one night I saw a man creep from a house carrying a small iron chest. I peered through a window in the house and saw a couple lying dead within. One strangled, the other stabbed to death. In a flash, I was on the miscreant and had him by the neck. You murdered them for money, I said softly. Caught in the grip of superstitious fear, he could but nod. Who are you, he squeaked. Nemesis, I told him. And in a second, my teeth were at his throat. When my craving had been satisfied, I took his body and the chest and heaved them back inside the murder house. Let the authorities make of that what they would. I had never felt so good. What at first had been horrible to me soon became natural and then enjoyable. My bloodlust came on me only about once every two months, and in that time it was easy to find someone who deserved death. I moved to Nice, probably not how you say it, and took a job as tutor to the two rather unintelligent children of a duke. Then, after two years, I returned to Paris. The house was shut up. The Baroness Idelia von Hochburn had moved away, and nobody knew where. I went to find her, a uh, man of business, and he shook hands with me gravely. The Baroness has returned to her ancestral estates, he told me. When you returned, I was to give you this and tell you that she loved you, and you are always welcome wherever she goes. He handed me a thick envelope. Ancestral estates. I retreated to a nearby cafe and opened the envelope. There was a letter within. My lovely orange. Time passes, and I must move on. People are already starting to remark on how youthful I look. Forgive me as I forgive you. We shall never meet again. Wait, no. Shit, sorry. We shall meet again. That's important. We shall meet again. You shall not want for money. Take care, mother. Along with the letter were some legal documents that told me how to access the money mother had left for me. There was sufficient, uh, there was sufficient so that I would not want. I moved from Paris to London. Having a faculty for language, I picked up English easily and soon took a position as an assistant in an import-export firm with the intention of learning the business. I adjusted well to my new life. My need for the company of women did not lessen, but I avoided deep relationships, satisfying myself with casual affairs with women of easy virtue. Once a month or so, the urge would come on me and I would do what I had to do. The guilt I suffered became less and less as time passed. I never came to like what I was forced by my nature to do, but I came to enjoy doing it. The thrill of the chase more than made up for the danger, and I feasted on no one who did not deserve to die. But that which set me apart made me feel like an exile in the midst of life. I suffered from loneliness. I could find no others like me. Mother had said there were few of us, but not how few. For a while I used the recognition signal of the Strix to often in public places so often in public places that it was becoming an involuntary tick, but no one ever responded. Aside from sharing my dreadful secret, others of my kind could give me solace through the years as those mortals whom I befriended grew old and died, although I could never stay in one place long enough for that to happen, as mother had. I must move before my uh, contemporaries noted my failure to age. I thought of creating my own partner, of gently sucking the blood from the neck of some lovely woman until, over time, the miraculous transformation took place. But I would not do it to someone against her will, and how do you suggest such a thing? I thirsted for the companionship of someone of my own kind. I had been in London for about eight years and was considering moving on when I went one evening to a very exclusive bordello in the company of a brace of acquaintances who considered themselves to be dashing young men about town. Madame Lillis, it was called, 
The madam, I was told, was as young and beautiful as any of her girls, but you didn't sh but you didn't choose her. She, if she wished, chose you. The building, right around the corner from Blakeney Blake Blake -nee Square, was a four-story Georgian structure with a wide front door straddled by a pair of ornate gas lights. A paged boy answered the door pool, and my two companions led the way into the parlor. A score of beautiful women in various stages of dishabo <laughs> lounged about the room. In one corner, a thin, totally bald man with a very pale face played the piano. A young coquette who was in conversation with the colonel of the artillery as we came in excused herself and walked over to greet us. Her costume was less revealing than those of her sisters, but one could not call it chaste. Her body spoke of youth and innocence, and her face was veiled in some silky fabric. It's, it is Madame herself, one of my companions whispered to me. Madame pushed aside the veil and stretched her arms out to me. So marvelous to see you again. You are but little changed, and that for the good. You know her, my companion asked. I took her hand. She looked younger than I remembered. For a second, I was unable to speak, but then I regained my composure. This lady taught me all I know, I said, and I know now that I have much more to learn. Mother kissed me on the lips. My precious orange, she said. And that was In the Blood by... Uh, God. Michael Curlin. My cat just had like a nasty. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I like that one. Um, I wish I had more to do with vampires. It's kind of a lovely little tale about um family and you know loving your mother and things very sweet i liked it i wish it had a little bit more to do with vampires though than just like she said i'm a vampire and then like 20 years later oh look at that i'm a vampire <laughs> um it'd be cool if there was like a sequel or something <laughs> i did like the writing though i hope you guys liked it what else I don't, I don't know if I have any other thoughts. <laughs> okay, next one is Victims by Christine Catherine Rush. Hold on a sec. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> oh, it's got like, um, it's got a, it's got a one. It's in five parts, I think. Okay, one. Her name had shown up twice before, in 68 when Nicholas had run for governor of California, and in 72 when he made his unsuccessful bid for the presidency. No one had investigated her. Women's issues were different in those days, and women were not viewed as the voting bloc they are now. Besides, we couldn't make anything on Nicholas stick. stick. What? It's more Nichols, honestly. The governor. Nichols. We decided to investigate her before we talked with Senator Lurie. The task of interrogating her came to me. I used Senator Lurie's outer office because it looked properly intimidating. Mahogany trim, marble inlay floors. The desks were wide, oak and handmade. A coffee, mater, coffee maker, constantly in use, sat on top of one of the green metal filing cabinets. But the rich, rich scent of French roast couldn't overlay the mausoleum stench of an ancient building that has stood in humidity for a generation too long. I arrived a full hour early, then adjusted my tie and peered at my reflection in the shiny glass on top of the secretary's desk. The cowlick had refused to be tamed again. I licked my hand and patted the spot, wishing for the fifteenth time that I could use boyishness to my advantage. From the neck down, I was perfect broad shoulders tapering into narrow hips, legs firm and muscular. My face was the major problem. Oval shaped with wide eyes and pouty lips, it made me look like a 12-year-old in his fa father's body, which was the reason I worked behind the scenes for Senator Lurie instead of out front and as most of the captains had in the past. I didn't dare look native in front of a woman named Veronique, especially a woman with a history like hers. Downstairs, a door slammed shut. I jumped. High heels clicked on the marble floor. 
the sound echoing in the empty building. I had often worked late, but never alone. Near midnight on those evenings, the place had a hum to it that I always associated with an election or a smear campaign, never with an interview. She had insisted on the time. A woman in my profession, she had said, her voice husky through the phone lines, looks best after dark. I tugged on my black suit jacket. I wasn't really alone. Morse sat in the senator's office, watching through the fake mirror in case the lady decided to ply her trade on me. The footsteps grew closer. I rearranged the papers on the desktop, toyed with sitting down, and then decided to remain standing. I still hadn't learned all the tricks to power and intimidation. The door opened and she slipped in. She was heartbreakingly thin, with perfect legs that tapered from a model's body. She wore spike heels, fishnets, and a leather mini skirt that revealed each curve around her hips. Her black Irish lace blouse set off her porcelain skin. Her lips were dark red, her cheekbones high, and her eyes an amazing shade of brown. No wonder she ran the most exclusive escort service in D.C. No man would be able to say no to her. I stepped from behind the desk, resisting the urge to wipe my hands on my pants leg. I approached her, palm extended. Reese Catton. She placed her fingers lightly in mine. Her skin was cool, not, as, not cold as I had expected. Veronique de la Merck. Her voice was husky and warm. A tingle ran up my spine. Ever since vampires and vampirism had come out of the closet five years ago, the news and the tabloid press had been full of articles on the sensual effect of the predator-victim relationship. It didn't seem to matter that all but a few psychopathic vampires had long ago given up killing human prey, choosing instead to use a handful of willing people to provide blood, much as a blood bank did for a hospital. The supermarket approach to bloodsucking, the New York Times had called it. The fear, loathing, and sexual tension caused by the human-vampire relationship filled the popular imagination, just as she filled mine. Dry facts weren't giving me control. I took a deep breath and slid into the leather chair behind the desk. I hope you understand why we contacted you, I said. Oh, yes, her voice was soft. It's about Governor Nichols. She had an edge when she spoke his name, a frisson of anger just beneath the surface. I swallowed, feeling calmer. I hope you don't mind if I tape this conversation. I expected you to, she said, and folded her hands demurely in her lap. I pressed the button underneath the desk, activating the room's taping system, and wondered for a moment if vampires' voices taped. But I knew they did. We had gotten tape on one just a few weeks ago. They didn't reflect on film, but that was because of the silvering in the mirrors, the play of light and shadow. I understand, I said, leaning forward and placing my arms on the desk, that you've never spoken with anyone about Governor Nichols. She smiled, revealing straight white teeth. Oh, I've spoken with people, she said. Only no one believed me. I froze. Her last sentence had thrown me. We were planning, with her cooperation, to smear the former governor by linking him to a vampire as her cow. Our preliminary surveys of the 150 voters showed that such a thing would work as effectively as gay bashing had in the 80s. What do you mean? On July 4th, 1966, your friend, the former governor of California, raped me. She never took her gaze off mine. She spoke calmly, but the ends of the words were clipped as if she had to spit them out. I let out the air I had been holding. She was lying. We couldn't bring this to the media. They would skin her alive. Why didn't you press charges? A half smile, curving those delicate lips into her firm cheekbones. I tried. It was 1966. I was told that a woman who ran an escort service couldn't complain when she gets she got famous business. Who told you that? The detective in charge, she said. An unfortunately deceased man named Petrie. His superior officers backed up his prejudice. I haven't spoken of the incident since. I figured it would be even tougher to convince people now that they know I belong to a completely different race. Why didn't she go after him? Her eyes seemed to tilt downward with an expression of deep sadness, as if she were disappointed in me for asking the question. Come now, Mr. Catton. What did you expect me to do? Fly into his house on bat wings and rip out his throat? Something like that, I mumbled. My cheeks grew warm. I guess I had expected that. Old fictional images died hard. Studies had shown that vampires lacked the ability to shapeshift and mesmerize, although they did have centuries-long life life centuries-long lifespans and the appearance of eternal youth. Mr. Catton, I have used my political contacts for the better part of two decades to keep the former governor of California out of the presidency. 
The times are changing, and the country doesn't seem to care what kind of man he is, as long as he presents a positive media image. Grandfather Lee always seems to work with this country. Well, as you know, any connection with me would ruin Nicole's grandfatherly image. She stood and smoothed her skirt. The problem you face is that I am unwilling to be linked to that slime romantically or parasitically. We will denounce him as a man capable of extreme violence, or you will not have my cooperation. Forgive me, I said from my chair, but I don't think middle America would care if you got raped. She took a step for- She- My cat's crying. Why are you crying at me? I'm busy. You're being disruptive. I'm reading a good story. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, say hi to my booster. Say hi, my booster. You can't see him. Hello. Hi. I'm reading a story about vampires. I can't read if you bug me. Will you let me read, please? <laughs> oh, God. Where was I? Um, she took a step backward as if I had slapped her myself. I suppose you're right, she said. Middle America would simply figure that a woman like me deserved it. Uh, part two. I was shaking by the time I got home. Allison had gone to bed, leaving a single light on near the fireplace. Embers glowed, light reflecting across the, shitty, uh, the shiny hardwood floor. This place always filled me with a kind of pride. The way the couches framed the oriental rugs, the fresh flowers on the Duncan Fife end tables and lemon-scented neatness of the condo itself. Even though I had been raised a captain, my mother kept a messy, lived-in house in Connecticut that hid my father's wealth. I preferred an immaculate, house-beautiful style. Except tonight. Tonight, I wanted to kick off my shoes, scrunch the rugs, and huddle near the television set. But I pulled off my shoes and hung them on the shoe rack in the closet beside the door, walked stocking-footed across the slippery floor, and sat at the dining room table, staring at the fruit basket, perfectly arranged, with bananas on the side, oranges at the base, and apples on top. Veronique had gotten to me. I had never been naive, not even when I had come to Washington as a page for Senator Laurie 15 years ago. Any pretensions I may have had uh, remaining toward truth, justice, and the American way were then bled out of me in George Washington's poli-sci department and at Harvard Law. Politics in this country ah, <laughs> had become the battle of the image. Whoever controlled the media controlled the campaign. She was scrunched up so weird. <laughs> for everywhere. Girl. <laughs> Be cute for the camera. God, I have to brush you. <laughs> so much fur just fell off of my hand. <laughs> okay, we're reading about the 1990s middle America. Veronica and her escort service hadn't been necessary in 68 and 72. Nichols had done a good job of destroying his own campaign. Then he disappeared behind the scenes, became a scion of the Republican Party, helped Reagan and Bush achieve office, and maintained his own series of perks. The media had forgotten all about the bumbling youth candidate who had challenged Nixon in the 72 primaries and saw only the trim, natty got grandfather who had helped the Republican who had helped the Republicans become a power in the 80s. A viceless, happily married man who spoke, spoke of family values and allowed Pat Robertson to fund his campaign. I'm trying to read and also scratch her at the same time. And there's fur on my face. <laughs> at least she's making the sad story about rape a little bit better. Good lord. The kind of man, Senator Lurie, whose presidential ambitions had died the night of his daughter's suicide in 80, despised. Lurie had vowed to clear the way for the Democratic challenger, whether that might be Clinton, Gore, or a wild card no one had ever heard of. We had demolished Quayle before he even, he even announced, but Nichols was proving to be as Teflon as Reagan had been. The rape charge wouldn't stand. I had been right. Middle America wouldn't tolerate it. They would bring down the messenger. I sighed and placed my forehead on my arms. We had contacted Veronique because the call girls had not so inexplicably shut up. The records had disappeared on the reported spousal abuse in the mid-70s, and the college plagiarism charge hadn't caused a ripple in the polls. An affair with a vampire, we figured, still had taint, even though it was nearly 30 years old. 
although it would be a gamble. If word of the smear got out, Lurie would lose his position as champion of the non-traditional. Vampires, gays, and minorities formed a large percentage of his constituency. If Lurie got caught, he would, of course, blame his assistants. He would blame me. Three. What'd he do, Lurie asked. Force her to bite him at gunpoint? He was a big man who barely fit in the desk chair that had been specially designed for him ten years previously. He had long jowls that spoke of too many meals and the red bulbous nose of a hardcore alcoholic. His voice boomed, even in the small office. God, there's so much fur. Babe, I have to brush you. Ugh. His voice boomed, even in the small office. It always amazed me that he could tarnish the image of anyone. I shot a glance at Stucky, his press secretary. She had a small, heart-shaped face, almond eyes, and cafe, cafe a lout skin. Her mixed heritage was as much a part of her job as was her way with words. She didn't go into the details of the rape, I said. Stucky leaned back in her chair, her long, slender fingers playing with the ruby on her left hand. We would need proof of some kind, police report, photographs. Photographs are impossible. I picked the lint off my black pinstriped pants leg, and she said that the police refused to believe her. If they were called to the site, someone had to write it up, Stucky said. It's probably buried in some back file in a basement somewhere. I'll bet Nichols didn't think to cover his tracks on this one. I don't see any reason why he had to. Reese was right. Middle America isn't going to give a darn about some blood-sucking parasite got slapped around 30 years ago. Stucky jotted out her narrow chin. Forty years ago, someone might have said the same about her. I hated him when she got that look. Be careful, Senator, she said. The Republicans would love to hear you talking like that. For God's sake, he said, leaning forward. His exquisitely tailored suit strained at its buttons. It's the truth. There's another truth, Stucky said. She has been an influential member of Washington society since the 30s. She contributes to all sorts of charities, and it could be said that her escort business provides a necessary service for this community. There is no overt evidence of prostitution, and any employee who provides sexual services on a regular basis drops off the payroll of the service and appears on the payroll of the client. Would she make an articulate spokesperson, Captain? I nodded. Something about Lurie's reaction was bothering me. She would, except that we can't film her. That doesn't matter, Stucky said. Neither can they. I say let's see what we've got and then make a decision. We might be able to use the woman after all. No, Lurie said. He folded his hands over his chest. Stucky raised one eyebrow. She opened her mouth to speak as they put a finger on her arm. What's your connection with her, Senator? I asked. His expression didn't change, but his gaze seemed to go flat. It was a look I recognized from his press conferences, the Lurie method of avoiding the truth. She runs an escort service for the Washington elite Reese. There's no telling what kind of dirt we might inadvertently dig up. I suppressed a sigh. Lurie had always been a wild man. The wildness had gotten worse since his daughter's death. During my college years, the staff had worked hard at covering his destructive tracks all over the city. I had worked hard when I came on board the second time to hold on to other staff members, particularly the women who hated his roving hands and not-so-subtle innuendo. The others trusted me because they knew I was a fam family man, a man who would never treat others the way Lori did. But this was something that had fallen through the cracks. Stucky had come to the same conclusion. She hated working for Lurie, hated that the man behind the excellent political record was a petty tyrant, sexist, and a bigot. It might be your last chance to get Nichols, she said. Lurie spun the swivel on his chair so that he looked out the window instead of staring at us. He was silent for a long time. Finally, he said, I don't care. We can't afford the risk. We'll have to find some other way. I doubt there is another way, Stucky said. She left the room. I followed more slowly. As I closed the door, I saw Lurie reach into his liquor cabinet. It was too early to drink, even for him. 4. Despite Lurie's refusal to pursue the investigation, Stucky continued. So did I. I was too intrigued to let it go. Maybe after we had the evidence, Lurie would allow us to run to the media. It had happened before. Stucky put one of our best detectives on the case a secret infiltrator who had no visible connections to us. The detective would make it look to the police like an investigation of Veronique Delamere instead of an investigation of Nichols. <clears throat> this would, uh, that would keep the information out of the press until we were ready to put it there ourselves. 
Stucky and I were supposed to meet with the senator after the detective's report came in, but I had some questions of my own to answer. Veronique's escort service had headquarters near the hill. I parked a block away and waited until no one was looking before I entered the building. The elevator took me to the sixth floor of offices. As I stepped through the double glass doors, a level of tension left me. The offices were tasteful. The colors were out of date. The muted grays and pinks of the mid-80s, but the garish purples and neon greens of the early 90s would have looked out of place here. Flowers in Waterford crystal vases stood on runners that crossed antique tables. All of the furniture was antique, mixing periods to great effect. The tables were early American, the couches late Victorian. The lighting and the crystal were modern. The decor gave the feel of a place that had uh, been in business for a long, long time. The carpet absorbed my footfalls, and I was alone in the waiting room. I assumed that was on purpose. It made the clients feel as if discretion was part of the service. A woman entered through a sliding glass door. She wore a white silk dress that flowed around her voluptuous body. Her long black hair flowed down her back, as untamed as the dress. Do you have an appointment, sir? Her voice was as well modulated as the rest of her. A shiver ran down my spine. No, I said, a little more harshly than I expected. I am from Senator Lurie's office. I would like to see Veronique. The woman nodded once. Come with me, she said, and without waiting went back through the glass doors. The hallway was long and narrow and smelled faintly of lilacs. Closed doors along each side gave this area a forbidding feeling that the front didn't have. Privacy above all else. How odd. Veronique mastered privacy in her business, yet she was willing to give it all away to bring down Nichols. She really had to hate him. The woman opened the double mahogany doors at the end of the hallway, then stepped aside so that I could enter. I stepped onto another waiting room, although this one was more flamboyant than the one I had left. The colors were red, black, and deep browns, and all of the furniture was late Edwardian, heavy with thick upholstery. The room had a masculine feel, as if it were designed by a man for a woman. The door closed behind me. I sat on the edge of the couch, feeling 16 again, and at the interview for my page position, I tugged on the knees of my trousers. They were tight across the groin. The door opened, and then Veronique was in the room. She wore her hair piled her hair piled on top of her head, revealing a slender, well-formed neck. This time, she wore a suit. The jacket was open, and the shell was cut low across her breasts, revealing cleavage. She sat on the edge of her desk and crossed her legs. I didn't expect to see you here, Mr. Catton. I swallowed. I was a happily married man. Allison and I had a good sex life. I didn't need anything else. I'm here on business. She smiled. Most people are. No, I said. For Senator Lurie. Ah. She got off the desk and retreated behind it, tugging her coat across her chest. You want to know details. How can a human male rape a woman of superior strength? It's really quite easy, Mr. Catton. It simply takes planning. He must learn where I sleep, for that's when I am most vulnerable, and learn how to tie me up, how to immobilize my mouth. Determination, Mr. Catton. That's not why I'm here, I said. I couldn't stand the calm tone she was using with me. I've been thinking about this. We're investigating your claim now, but it doesn't completely make sense to me. Assume that I believe you. What's in this for you? You have other, more subtle ways to bring down nickels. Why choose a haphazard method that may not work? She smiled and leaned back, letting the coat pull open again. And you can see more of her boobs. I forced myself to look into her eyes. You're very smart, Mr. Catton, she said. I licked my lips. She made me nervous, here in her lair. I try to be. Then perhaps you will understand that I am tired of being hidden. My people have been out of the closet, to use your quaint phrase, for five years now, and we are still fighting myths and prejudices. We live long lives and have experiences that encompass entire generations. You, we understand policy and its ramifications better than you do. But our limitations, Mr. Catton, come obvious, uh, become obvious once the camera was invented. We cannot run for office. We could not even try until a few years ago. I tugged again at my pants leg. It was good they couldn't run. Good that television cameras couldn't pick them up. With their charisma, they would win every time. People are too afraid of you to elect you. Yes, she said. I know. But things change over time. We have seen that with uh, African Americans and with women. We have decided that it is better to fight in an open forum than behind the scenes. To put you up against Nichols's media machine is to sacrifice you to the prejudices of the American people. You'll lose. 
Perhaps, she said, but I'll damage Nichols, and I'll start the awareness that vampires are not the all-evil, all-powerful beings the movies have made them out to be. I ran a hand along the crushed velvet upholstery. I don't understand how choosing to become a victim will help you politically. She shrugged and smiled, just a little. Then, Mr. Catton, you're not as smart as I thought. I am, uh, sorry, uh, five. <laughs> I immediately hurried home. Fortunately, Allison was there. Much to her surprise, I dragged her to bed, and we made love like newlyweds in their sexual prime. We had just finished when the doorbell rang. She brushed the air from her forehead. You go on, she said, pushing me a little. I need to shower. I'm already late for a woman in business meeting. I slid on a pair of jeans, walked barefoot to the door, and looked through the peephole. Sucky was there, her face pale beneath the makeup. She clutched a stack of folders to her chest. Her briefcase rested on the floor beside her. I pulled the door open. We need to talk, she said, and came in without an inter uh, invitation. Her shoes left little points on the hardwood floor. What? What? Her shoes left little prints on the hardwood floor. She set everything on the dining room table, pushing the basket of fruit aside to make room. I sat down beside her, opened the files, and barely looked up when Allison kissed me goodbye. The files were dusty, the old police reports more detailed than I had expected, as if someone had been planning a case. The client had found Veronique naked, blood-covered, and half-dead in her waiting room. She had been tied with silver wire, a garlic bulb shoved in her mouth, and slashed from groin to sternum with a knife. The reports were filed by four separate officers and a pathologist. Veronique had been conscious enough to demand her private doctor, and instead of being treated by the hospital staff, she had been treated by a man now known as the vampire's equivalent of doctor to the stars. The files included photos of the crime scene and Veronique's account, both on tape and in writing, of the rape itself. The investigation ended as soon as the nature of Veronique's profession became known. Stucky watched me as I read Veronique's account. Nichols had not been there had not been alone, for other politicians of his generation had been there to take care of Veronique properly. Three of the four were dead, one in a single-engine plane crash over the Appalachians, one in an unsolved murder in Mexico, and one of an undiagnosed variety of pernicious anemia, which the doctor associated with leukemia, but which was now known to be caused by a bad reaction to secretions in vampire saliva. Hold on, I have to grab her. Come here. always know when to interrupt at the worst times you're the best come here baby you ran away from me stop running away from me she squeak she squeak she scrock she must make noise <laughs> okay if you sit here you'll be quiet right the only way I can ever make you quiet. <laughs> oh, God. The fourth was alive. Senator Jason Lurie, then a first-term congressman from the great state of Texas. I brought my head up. Stucky was watching me, elbow on the table, chin resting on her palm. She sat us up, I said. Stucky rolled her eyes. Veronique is not the problem, she said. It's Lurie. He lied to us and to his constituents from the beginning. Did you read why he participated? I shook my head. I had stopped when I saw his name. Because she was withholding favors from them. Political favors. She was refusing to use her sexual influence to aid their careers. I let my breath out slowly. Raping her was certainly not the way to get her to help. No, Stucky said. But I sent a message throughout the community. A lot of people knew what she was. They must have figured these men had a lot of muscle behind them to get her as badly as they did. I rubbed the bridge of my nose. A headache was holding behind my eyes, was building. It all made sense now. Lori and Nichols had ceased being friends in 67. Something must have come between them then, something to do with Veronique. They managed to succeed without her, but not to the heights they had wanted. And whenever they had come close to achieving those heights, something had successfully damaged their careers, like Lori's daughter's suicide. What I don't understand is why she's doing this now, I said. I talked to her. I was going public. I said going public would make her a victim. And why would anyone want to be a victim? She laughed at me and called me naive. Stucky blinked at me and then grinned. You're not naive, she said. You're just privileged. Reese Catton, son of politicians, product of private schools and Ivy League law schools. Even your name has the sound of wealth. 
I squirmed, suddenly cold without my shirt. What the hell does that mean? It means you're one of the lucky few who've never been victimized. She leaned forward, a flush rising beneath her dusky skin. Reese, honey, victims are victims when they remain quiet. They gain power when they speak out. The headache had moved up to my temples. She had power. It looks like she had controlled their careers from the inside. But that's a revenge cycle, Stucky said. And no more empowering than punching a man who mugged you. You need to read more about ways to help the powerless. Look what empathy did for Bobby Kennedy. Yeah, I said standing. It got him assassinated. Six. This time we met in neutral territory at the Lincoln Memorial. I waited on the steps after dark in the shadows of Honest Abe himself. Honest Abe, who had suspended civil rights and freed the slaves as a matter of political expediency. Honest Abe, who really wanted to send all the blacks back to Africa. I heard her before I saw her. Heels clicking against the sidewalk, a purse clutched to her arm. She wasn't wearing hooker clothes or a business suit. This time she wore jeans and a mohair sweater. The outfit suited her more than the others had. You set me up, I said, before I could see her face in the streetlight. No, she climbed the stairs and sat beside me on the top. She smelled faintly of lilacs. I have just learned that it is easier to convince people when they discover the information for themselves. You wouldn't have believed me if I attacked your precious senator. You believe me now. I did that. If nothing else, I believe Veronique's version of those events back in 1966. What do you want from me? We need a spokesman. You are our best choice. You are young, moving into that youthful handsomeness that this country associates with its romantic leaders. But the problem is you have no dreams, no ideals. We will give those to you. She ran a hand through her hair. There was nothing seductive about her this night. You see, what your histories have forgotten is that the, symbio the symbiosis went beyond the physical. Your people provided the energy, the power, and the drive. Ours, the sense of community and con continuity. Over the centuries, we failed to keep our end. We stagnated and you rebelled. A rebellion that culminated with the invention of the camera became codified with the publication of Stoker's horrible political tract. But we have learned our lesson. We would like to forge a new voice in the political history of the Western world. We would like a new alliance, and we need your help. I leaned back, resting my elbows on the cool, concrete stairs. I should have been used to power games. I had initiated enough myself. But I had been off balance in this one from the beginning. Why me? Why not someone like Stucky? Because, she said, you have no personal access to grind, no commitment to anything except yourself, your lovely wife, and your home. We don't want someone with other ties that might interfere with our cause. Words were carved into the walls above me. Great words, spoken by a man considered by many to be one of our best leaders. Who knew why he ran for office? Power madness? A belief he could make a difference? Ego? All three or none of the above? I shook my head. I'm sorry, I said. I don't know anything about you people. For all I know, you could be trying to take over the country. She smiled, her teeth flashing in the streetlights. Isn't that what every special interest group hopes to do? Not every special interest group has the power of persuasion that you people have. She touched my hand. Her fingers were cold. I should make myself clear. I'm not asking you to run for president. I want you to resign as Lori's aide, then help me make a public case against them. Her fingers were long and slender. The nails tapered. Forgive me, I said, keeping my voice soft. But I was right from that first night. Middle America won't care that you were raped. Make them care. That would be your job. I moved my fingers out of her grasp. There are better people for that. Image brokers. People who make their living changing public opinion. But none are as impeachable as you. She leaned back beside me. Unimpeachable. <laughs> that wasn't clear. Think of it. You worked for Senator Lurie. You discovered the information yourself. It so appalled you that you are jeopardizing your own political career to speak out against him. I tilted my head back so that I couldn't see her. Abe's carbs, carved legs spread slightly apart, towered above me. She would do this with or without me, and she would fail, but the die would be cast. Conversations would start, people would talk, ideas would get aired as they had at the beginning of each intellectual and perceptual revolution. The balance of power was shifting beneath me. I could cling to the old or leap to the new, or I could attempt to straddle the middle and watch the world as I knew it crumble beneath my feet. I had planned to resign anyway. I needed a new job. Let me bring Stucky along and I'll do it, I said. You may have anyone you want on your team. Veronique stood and wiped off the back of her jeans. 
Come to me after you've publicly announced your resignation. We'll finalize our agreement then. She walked down the steps, heels clicking until the darkness swallowed her. I don't know how I ever thought she wanted to be a victim. She had more power than all the rest of us combined. The power of her convictions. I envied that. It was something I had never seen in Washington. Maybe the world was shifting more than I thought. End of story. And, oh my god, what was that called? Victims by Christine Catherine Rush, which is very different from any of the other stories, which I guess you could kind of say about all of them, honestly, but I feel like this one was very different. Not like a top-down approach of a world where vampires exist but don't have any real power. Maybe to vote? I don't know. It was interesting. Um, I don't know if I particularly like it. Because I'm not really into, like, House of Cards style stories. But I could see why somebody would like it or want to write it, you know? It's, like, one thing to write, like, a crazy dude becomes president. It's another thing to write, like, vampires want to be recognized when they're raped. (laughs) And seen as, like, full beings with autonomy (laughs) that aren't just like bats. (laughs) Um, I'm sure this story has the audience. It's not necessarily me, but I'm not going to say it's bad. Um, uh, maybe you are the audience, and if so, congratulations. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> hope everyone here enjoyed this tonight with me, um, the Sisters of the Dark reading. We're, um, there's only 15 stories in this one, which is different from the book I read before. Um, we're about, yeah, we're past halfway. That was the 10th out of... 15 if you include the tiny introduction which the uh the like the cover does for some reason <laughs> so yeah i guess 11 out of 15 um we're gonna finish it in another like two readings i have nothing else to say i'm repeating myself <laughs> oh no okay it's fine the candle lit out when it fell <laughs> oh no part of it stuck to my sweater of course that happened god Well, anyway, thanks for being here, especially if you made it to the end. I greatly appreciate it. We, um, uh, I'm, I just have a lot of fun getting to hang out here with you guys and read vampire stories that I could read alone, but I never seem to finish alone. So thank you for helping me start, continue, and hopefully finish this book. I hope you like it. I like it a lot. I'm having fun. And I will be here next Sunday. Six o'clock, uh, six o'clock Eastern Standard Time, give or take fifteen minutes. I tend to be late. <laughs> okay, I'll see you then. Hopefully, bye guys. <laughs>